Welcome, welcome. If you guys are here for Balance's Transcending Barriers to Treatment for the LGBTQ plus community webinar, you are in the right place. Feel free to utilize our chat options to stay engaged with the webinar and with our presenter, um, and then use the Q&A feature to add any questions, if you guys want, feel free to pop into the chat where you guys are zooming in from. That would be great. We've got people zooming in from all over. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Wow, we've got some international people. Thanks for coming. Welcome. Welcome um, to our webinar on transcending barriers to treatment for the LGBTQ plus community. My name is Taylor. I am the lead intake coordinator here in the admissions department. Um, and we've got a few other people hanging out with us from admissions um, and from our marketing team. So welcome. A little bit about Balance. We are a premier eating disorder treatment center offering boutique outpatient treatment options using evidence-based practices. So what we mean by boutique is that we offer a nice small community um, with our clients. We offer small group sizes and um, a good client to clinician ratio. If you guys have any questions about that, you can feel free to uh, schedule a call with us after the webinar to talk with someone in our admissions department a little bit more about um, specific programs that we offer. Alrighty, and then today we have our lovely panelists, Beck, pronouns they, them, there. Beck is a licensed social worker with years of experience working in community-based programs, residential eating disorder programs, and at the outpatient level of care. They have historically worked with the queer and trans community, those looking to explore sexuality, and folks struggling with eating disorders and body image. So. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it on over to Beck. Thanks so much, Taylor. All right, so today uh, we will be covering some terms. We'll define transness and other gender terms. We will look a little bit closer at the differences between gender dysphoria and body dysmorphia. We will take a closer look at oppression-based trauma and then finally go over some tools to overcome barriers to treatment. So before we jump in, I want to define some terms that folks may or may not be familiar with, starting with the idea of transness, which we define as the experience of being transgender. Being transgender or being trans is an umbrella term for being a person whose experienced gender does not align with the gender they were assumed to have at birth based on primary sex characteristics. And gender terms are the language that we use to convey how we relate to gender identity and gender expression. AFAB and AMAB means assigned female or male at birth respectively. We specifically say assigned because this is typically a doctor or a medical professional assuming that they know the gender of the baby being born based on genitals being presented as opposed to letting the child grow and express and identify their gender to us when they're ready. MTF means someone who is male and has transitioned to female and FTM is someone who is female and has transitioned to male. GNC or gender nonconforming refers to when the way someone expresses their gender differs from how they are expected to express or perform their gender. We know gender expression happens through clothing, voice or vocal changes, how someone walks, um, how much space they take up when they are sitting or standing, et cetera. Non-binary is a gender identity that indicates someone does not identify within the traditional realms of manhood or womanhood and identifies either as somewhere in between or off of the spectrum completely. Some people say that gender is a spectrum, meaning one, one, one end represents manhood and one end represents womanhood, and others say gender is a constellation because even the spectrum feels too limiting and doesn't acknowledge other genders that don't associate with the concepts of manhood and womanhood. And when I say cis or a cisgender person, cis being spelled C-I-S, 
I'm referring to someone whose experience gender is quote unquote aligned with the gender they were presumed to be based on those primary sex characteristics. How do you identify? So we see a privilege wheel or an identity wheel. This is meant to encourage you to take a closer look at what identities you hold that might carry privilege or be marginalized. We'll take between three and five minutes to fill this out individually, and I'll go over each category as well. So starting at the bottom left, um, we have sex assigned at birth, which is what we just defined, the sex you were assigned to be based on the genitals that were presented to the doctor or birthing professional. Gender expression is often put on a scale of masculine to feminine with androgyny sitting in the middle. And it again includes uh, if and how you wear clothing, accessories, makeup, uh, body hair, how you walk, uh, your vocal range, etc. Gender identity is the gender you experience yourself to be. Socioeconomic status is often defined in terms of low income, middle income, or high income. Political orientation is often put on a spectrum of liberal or leftist to conservative. Religion and spirituality indicates if you've grown up uh, or currently practice in an organized religion. Um, and when thinking about privilege as it relates to religion, privileged religions tend to be the ones uh, whose holidays are generally accounted for in the calendar year. In terms of education level, if you have a terminal degree in your field or a graduate degree, you will likely be paid and respected more in your field. Uh, body size ranges from uh, being in a thin body to being in a fat body with being in the middle a straight size or a mid-sized body, which of course impacts how others treat us as we move through the world. Disability status is the status of your functioning body. Uh, are you completely able-bodied all of the time? Do you have an invisible disability, a part-time disability or a chronic illness? Do you use a visible mobility aid or not? All questions to consider when looking at disability status as it relates to privilege or oppression. First language is the language that was spoken in the home while growing up. Immigration status is pretty self-explanatory as our race and ethnicity. So please go ahead and take, again, three to five minutes to fill this out. And then I'll check in around 12, 13. All right. So we can go ahead and put in the chat the identities that you found that you think about the least and the ones that you think about the most. What I find is interesting is we generally tend to think the most about the identities that have been that we hold that have been historically oppressed or marginalized. And we tend to be less conscious of the identities that hold privilege. So if you're feeling brave, we can go ahead and put in the chat which identities you feel the most conscious of or find yourself thinking about the most as well as the ones you think about the least. All right, we can get started with the next slide. So some basic principles we should acknowledge before taking a deeper dive are the fact that gender does not influence sexual orientation, right? We can have a trans woman, um, a cis man, a gender queer person, an agender person, meaning agender, meaning someone does not associate with the concept of gender or doesn't identify with the concept of gender. And they can all be straight or they can all be gay, they can all be bisexual. Being trans is not necessarily an indication of being queer or of not being queer. Eating disorder treatment centers and therapists should, of course, take gender and sexual orientation identities into account when creating treatment plans, because we know that higher levels of stress have been found in the queer trans population, uh, leading to higher instances of eating disorders and disordered eating. 
And we also need to take into account medical transition when working with trans folks uh, because hormone therapy might affect the biologically appropriate weight that dietitians are using to decipher how much weight restoration might be needed in folks with restrictive eating disorders. I also have on this slide the genderbred person, which I think is a really uh, kind of simple way to break down gender identity, gender expression, uh, attraction, and birth sex. So according to this genderbred person, gender identity lives up here in the head. It's how we experience our gender, how we identify our gender. Gender expression lives on the outside of us. So again, how we're wearing our clothes, how we're wearing accessories or makeup or um, body hair, things like that. Um, birth sex is often defined by the genitals that are seen during birth. And then attraction lives in the heart, which could be romantic or sexual attraction. So we have a question here asking about gender fluidity. I'm not, they said, where does gender fluid fit? I'm not sure if that's for the last slide where it fits in the circle. So maybe talk about that mm -hmm. and define gender fluidity. Yeah, so gender fluidity is a concept. Some people use it as an identity. Some people can identify as gender fluid, um, meaning that their gender is not static, or I'm sorry, that yes, that their gender is not static. Um, so some people might wake up one day, feel more towards the end of the spectrum, towards womanhood. Another, another day might wake up and feel more towards uh, identify more with a masculine gender identity or an androgynous gender identity, non-binary gender identity. Um, I would put it more towards the middle of the spectrum of gender. Um, or again, if we're looking at gender as a constellation, I might leave it even outside of the spectrum. Gender dysphoria and body dysmorphia. Let's look at the difference between those two. So body dysmorphia is an anxiety-based disorder, specifically an obsessive compulsive disorder that convinces the person experiencing this that at least one part of their body is inherently wrong or disproportionate from the rest of their body. This often causes misperceptions of their actual body. Folks who experience this look in the mirror and do not process their body size in the same way that an objective viewer might process their body size. Most people who experience body dysmorphia are convinced there is something wrong with their physical body rather than being able to acknowledge that there's something wrong with a society that has taught them to hate their bodies or that there is something wrong with their bodies. Something that's also important to note is that if this body part that they're so fixated on is quote unquote fixed, say if someone um, has body dysmorphia around their stomach size and gets liposuction, the body dysmorphia does not go away. The body dysmorphia can stay with the same part of their body or move into a different part of their body. It's a bit like a, um, like a whack-a-mole phenomenon. Gender dysphoria is a significant grief, anxiety, or distress related to one's gender identity being different from the gender they were presumed to have at birth or than the gender they are read as socially. Some people experience gender dysphoria uh, may choose to medically transition or pursue medical alterations to their body to better express their gender. Some people may not feel the need to medically alter their body at all, but still experience distress around, their way, around the way their body is perceived publicly and interpersonally as it relates to gender, uh, such as surgeries or hormone therapy. Gender dysphoria, unlike body dysmorphia, has the potential to not be related to the body at all. Um, meaning if someone has, is non-binary and they have a large chest or a trans man and they have a large chest, they may not be experiencing distress around their chest size. Their chest size might feel in total alignment with their gender or how they see their gender but publicly they will generally be assumed to be a woman and that misperception is what causes the distress. Also, unlike body dysmorphia, if a trans person experiences dysphoria around one part of their body and that part is quote unquote corrected through um, things like top surgery, which is removal of breasts or implantation of breasts, facial feminization surgery, uh, hair electrolysis, 
vocal coaching to make the voice higher or lower, et cetera, the dysphoria will likely dissipate versus the whack-a-mole phenomenon that we tend to see in body dysmorphia cases. So what does it feel like to have an eating disorder in a trans body? A trans person with an eating disorder is grappling with the body ideals of both the gender they were assumed to be when born and also body ideals of their true or experienced gender. So an FTM person, again, a female to male person who grew up entrenched in diet culture, and the majority of us did grow up entrenched in diet culture, whether or not that was inside the home, experiences the pressure of having a thin hourglass figure as a woman, and also experiences the pressure of having a muscular toned body as a man. There is an extreme dis experienced physical discomfort, or there can be a physical discomfort in living in a trans body that has an eating disorder. There can be uh, dysmorphia and or dysphoria, as well as bodily dissociation, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Lastly, those who are on hormone treatments, such as estrogen or testosterone, might experience mood swings, which might lead to mood dysregulation and more intensified behavior use in the eating disorder realm, such as restriction of food, binging on food, or purging of food. Of food. Eating disorders and dissociation. One thing uh, I wanna quickly note is the social acceptability of eating disorders, uh, different kinds of eating disorders. Restriction is often praised in our society. Clean eating and other orthorexic thinking is not only praised, but encouraged and sold to us. Um, quick side note for those who don't know, orthorexia is a disproportionate obsession with being healthy and often includes fad diets and or compensatory exercise. Restriction is often seen as cleaner behavior than binging and purging, because with a binge purge episode, you're actively choosing to engage in behavior versus restriction of food that can be a more passive choice or experience. Um, I'm thinking about narratives like I simply forgot to eat food, which would be restriction, versus I'm going to make this active choice to consume a large quantity of food and then self-induced vomit, which is not seen as um, more feminine behavior. Restricting can also be a way to dissociate from the body. Um, if we don't have to come in contact with our bodies via food, over time we learn to ignore things like hunger cues, uh, cues of tiredness even, or temperature cues, um, et cetera, and just learn to override the body into making it do what we want it to do. Binging can also be a way to dissociate from the body, letting the sole focus of the moment be on the food that's being consumed. And often when binging, people report dissociating or not remembering a binge clearly or not listening to satiety cues because they were so focused on getting in as much food as possible. Intuitive eating uh, on the other end of the spectrum or using our body cues to help determine the type and the amount of food that we eat forces us to come in contact with our bodies, right? And listen to our bodies, which can feel scary and just unappealing to trans folks who don't want to acknowledge their bodies because they're so radically uncomfortable with them. What impacts how we see transness or transness in media? So non-binary and FTM folks are often represented in media by thin, masculine of center bodies. I think, uh, I think of Elliot Page. I think of um, Gottmik from RuPaul's Drag Race, who's a big drag star right now. I also think of like Skylar Baylor, who's a big D1 collegiate athlete doing a lot of um, advocacy around trans folks in collegiate sports and in sports in general. But truthfully, trans men and non-binary folks do not owe society a masculine gender expression or thinness. A non-binary person assigned female at birth is allowed to wear a dress, to express themselves femininely, and still be a valid non-binary individual. One person who I think of as challenging this uh, kind of body ideal or norm of non-binariness is Jonathan Van Ness, who uses he, she, and they pronouns. Uh, they were assigned male at birth 
and sport a full beard while also wearing traditionally feminine clothing and showing off their straight or mid-sized body. Gay men who are often represented uh, by muscular bodies, I'm thinking of like Colton from The Bachelor, who is a big name in the media a little while ago. Um, he has a body that's hyper hypermuscular and hypermasculine. And then MTF folks or folks who are male to female are expected to have hourglass figures and quote unquote pass. For those who don't know, uh, passing is the concept that a trans person must present their experienced gender so much so that they are quote unquote undetectable as a trans person um, or get what we call clocked as a trans person. We also talk about passing privilege, meaning those who are socially read as their experienced gender are less likely to face harassment, violence, unwanted stares, things like that. Um, and when I think of MTF icons who present with this kind of womanly body ideal, I think of uh, Laverne Cox from Orange is the New Black and MJ Rodriguez from Pose. And um, Caitlyn Jenner was a big name a little while ago as well. Most MTF folks in the spotlight are folks who have had medical interventions to conform to their body ideals of having this thin hourglass figure. But again, medical intervention is not necessary in order to be valid as a trans woman or just a trans person in general. So we know that people in all bodies can be trans regardless of size, race, age, and other social identity factors that we've already named. We also want to expand the definition of transness to those who do not alter their body uh, or their name or their pronouns or other social markers of gender. As I said before, someone can be gender conforming, meaning they present how they are expected to present uh, and they can still be trans. Someone can choose to not change their pronouns and still be trans. And we wanna make sure that we are incorporating clients' experience of being trans without limiting our understanding of them to, our, to their gender identity. This means we take into account things like um, minority stress and barriers to care that specifically trans people face. But we also take into account all other social identity factors like the ones we named on the identity wheel. This concept is also called intersectionality, the idea that we all hold multiple intersections of identity. Oppression-based trauma. So we know oppression-based trauma can lead to increased stress and does lead to increased stress. Oppression-based trauma is the idea that simply moving through the world with a marginalized identity can be, and for many people is traumatic. This trauma includes microaggressions, which are ways of communicating on an interpersonal level that communicate disrespect to an individual or a group of individuals. This could include intentional microaggressions, such as name calling or street harassment, but could also include unintentional microaggressions, such as unintentionally calling someone the wrong name or using the phrase identifies as. The phrase identifies as is a microaggression because it implies there is an alternative identity to the one the person is expressing. For example, if I say someone identifies as non-binary, it implies there is a truer identity than the one named uh, by the person. So rather than saying someone identifies as non-binary, I simply say someone is non-binary. Minority stress also stems from macroaggressions which are systemic ways of oppressing a group of people, such as not having gender neutral restrooms in place um, or regulations around gay men not being able to give blood. Minority stress and oppression-based trauma leads to increased levels of stress, which heightens likelihood of disordered eating and eating disorders. 54% of queer and trans adolescents have been diagnosed with an ED in their lifetime, which is over half of the teenage uh, queer and trans population. It's also only representing those who had the privilege of getting assessed and getting a diagnosis. 
Gender non-conforming folks who were assigned female at birth are at a higher risk of developing eating disorders compared to their peers who are transitioning from male to female. And 42% of homeless youth are in the queer trans community, leading to increased stress, which snowballs into a higher rate of mental health problems and a lack of access to care. So medical versus social transitioning. There are tons of ways we indicate our gender to the world. Social transitioning can include changing one's name, changing one's pronouns, um, maybe wearing different clothes to indicate a new gender identity or a different gender identity. And medical transition includes medical interventions such as top surgery, bottom surgery, or hormone therapy. But I do want to emphasize that as we've learned, none of these aspects of medical transition or even social transition are a requirement to a valid trans identity. Another thing I want to mention is that intersex folks or folks whose genitals don't fit into traditionally male or female categories often receive surgeries upon birth to correct their bodies with or without parental consent when first born. These surgeries often focus on primary sex, char sex characteristics, particularly the genitals, without waiting to see what secondary sex characteristics will develop or how gender will expand as the child grows. This can lead to a really unhealthy relationship with their body and an understanding that their body is not their own and they cannot dictate what happens to it. So it really increases the distance between um, understanding of the body and ownership of the body. Fat phobia and transness. So fat phobia or weight stigma is uh, simply the fear of being fat or being in a larger body. It perpetuates the societal belief that a thinner body is inherently more respectable, more valuable, and more deserving of care. We see fat phobia all the time when people roll their eyes at people in larger bodies for taking up space in public or microaggressions pointed towards fat people that are often couched as concern. This might sound something like, I'm just worried about your health, when in reality, a statement like that is often coming from a place of fear. Um, fear sounding like, I don't understand how you can be healthy and fat, because that means I can be healthy and fat, which means being fat is a real possibility for me. And that possibility can feel scary in a culture that's so entrenched in fat phobia. We see systemic fat phobia when we go on airplanes and a fat person needs to go out of their way to ask for a seatbelt extender rather than just having every seat uh, have the every, every seatbelt have the potential to extend. This puts the labor back on the fat person to advocate for themselves rather than just having their needs met inherently and automatically. Fat phobia is also seen in the medical world, which is what we call medicalized fat phobia. This is when a doctor assumes weight loss is both the goal of the patient and the correct course of treatment, regardless of what the concern is that they came in for. I know someone who um, <clears throat> went to the emergency room for a broken ankle and left with a primary diagnosis of obesity, which doesn't, doesn't make sense. Uh, we see medicalized fat phobia in the trans healthcare system, specifically with top surgery. So again, that's removal of the chest or removal of breasts in particular. Um, for those looking to get top surgery, most surgeons will not perform top surgery if a patient is over a certain BMI. 26% um, of fat trans people reported being denied surgery due to their size and 78% of fat trans people reported avoiding the doctors completely to avoid being mistreated. And these fears are not unfounded. I was looking at a study that surveyed 400 physicians, 18%, so almost one in five, stated that they were disgusted by treating fat people. So the fear of going to the doctor, again, not unfounded. Some barriers to treatment. So some barriers to care. Yeah. A couple of questions on the last slide. Yeah. Um, um, do you have a preference between anti-fat of the terms 
anti-fat bias or fat phobia? Mm, I think of anti-fat bias as um, like kind of one-off instances and fat phobia as more of a system and a systemic uh, way of oppressing a large group of people. And then the last question on that slide is, what is the BMI requirement for top surgery and do doctors provide any research supporting the requirement? Um, good question. It depends on the doctor. Doctors have different requirements for BMI based on the surgery center that they're working out of. Um, and is the research <laughs> that supports those requirements depends who you ask. There's plenty of research that does not support those requirements, um, which, and I think it's also important to look at who's doing this research. Is this research done by fat people or by trans people, or is this research done by thin cis people um, who are looking to further um, reify fat phobia? So some barriers to care might include co-occurring diagnoses. With the increased minority stress in the queer trans community, members are likely to experience depression, anxiety, or some combination of the two. And we know already that adding in another mental health stressor can act as a barrier to accessing care. You're less likely to feel motivated to reach out for help with your eating disorder if your depression is causing you to stay in bed all day. Another barrier might be admission staff that are not knowledgeable about the trans experience. So if I, as a trans person, don't see a gender neutral restroom available in the facility where I'm doing my intake, I'm not gonna wanna continue or start program with that, with that facility. Similarly, if the admission staff ask me my sex, but not my gender and or pronouns, I'm going to assume the program is not knowledgeable about the intricacies and nuances of gender. Queer and trans folks face higher rates of unemployment, and with this comes higher rates of being uninsured, which poses obviously a huge barrier to treatment if one is paying out of pocket and not able to afford the intake process, let alone the actual course of treatment. Dietitians must be knowledgeable about hormone therapy because it might affect the BAW or the biologically appropriate weight they are using to set the treatment plan and trajectory for a client. Testosterone and estrogen therapies both redistribute fat and hormones throughout the body. So dietitians must know um, how this affects growth charts, particularly in adolescents that might be taking puberty blockers. resources to overcoming barriers. So um, these are some questions that uh, kind of are a concise way of framing questions that I get frequently. So some ways to affirm gender identity outside of bodily changes might be through social transition. So encouraging clients to play around with different names, different pronouns, and making your office and your relationship a safe space to do so. It might be important to check in with a client as much as every week with phrases like, what pronouns would you like me to use for you today? Or this is the name and pronoun set that I'm currently using. I just want to make sure this still feels good. I personally use uh, some CBT and social justice, justice techniques to define what femininity and masculinity mean to the client. Uh, I was working with someone once who related thinness to femininity and felt in order to be a true woman, she needed to be thin. So we spent a session just taking a look uh, through her TikTok, through her Instagram, looking at social media influencers who she deemed to be feminine and found that not actually all of the folks who she thought were feminine were thin or had traditional body shapes or conventional body shapes. This really helped her change what her perception of femininity was and helped her feel womanly in her weight restoring body. Many doctors will not prescribe hormone therapy or perform gender affirming surgery during the early stages of recovery as to not affect weight restoration. I have some case studies in the next slide. 
Um, I would like to go over those case studies. I will talk a little bit about the interventions that I used, but before I go into that, I will first just read the case studies. And if people have thoughts as to what they would do um, or what interventions they would use, I definitely would like to hear those before giving my two cents. So um, Victoria is an autistic, queer, transgender woman using she, her pronouns experiencing restrictive eating and purging. She currently lives with her mom and has a strained relationship with her dad who lives separately. She recently began hormone therapy, estrogen, and is working on regulating her eating as well as establishing feelings of safety when in public. So if folks just wanna put in the chat some interventions that they might use or thoughts about where they might start, that would be great. And when putting in the chat, if you could just say, um, there's an option to say to everyone or to hosts and panelists. If you wanna just make sure that everyone is clicked so that folks can see your responses, that would be great. Mm, Olivia, I love that before suggesting exposures outside of the home, check in on places they may already feel safe. I love that. Really identifying places where safety is already uh, felt and what does that physically feel like? What does that emotionally feel like? Danielle says uh, to look at the relationship with her family. Does she have support? In this case, her mom was very supportive. Her dad was financially supportive, um, but had a lot of, um, thoughts that he was not afraid to share about what she should be doing in order to make her body look more womanly. Um, Courtney says, checking in on what kind of sensory experiences feel escalating or soothing, especially in regards to connecting with her body or not. Love that. Yeah. So just for the sake of time, I will uh, share what I um, worked on with this client. Because of the intersection with autism, Victoria's eating disorder included a lot of rigid, strict rules. So a lot of psychoeducation around why those rules needed to be changed was helpful in explaining the importance of a routine eating pattern. So she had a lot of rules like, I don't eat after 7 p.m. Okay, let's break that down. Why, what is, where is this information coming from and how can we shift that information? There was also a lot of, a lot of rigidity around what makes a woman womanly, similar to the last client who I just talked about. So we tried to expand definitions of femininity to include an array of body types and expressions. We used CBT to identify core beliefs around what being a woman meant to her and what being socially read as a woman meant to her about her and her identity. We reframed thoughts like um, the original thought might've been, or the automatic thought, as it's called in CBT, uh, was if I eat, I will gain weight and then I will be less likely to pass, pass as a woman. And when reframing, we landed on something, something like uh, passing does not define my womanhood. Um, so Kai is a heterosexual transgender teenage boy using he, him pronouns who spent time at a residential eating disorder facility for a restrictive eating disorder. He comes into therapy seeking support to begin puberty blockers and vocalizes desire for eventual top surgery. His mom is concerned with the body changes and also reports he's experiencing reactive and angry behavior at home, push-pull dynamics with his parents, and bullying at school. So again, maybe just if you want to just throw in the chat some questions you might have or ask. Um, we have a question. Um, what are the requirements for adolescents to take pu puberty blockers? So it's kind of up to, I mean, there needs to be a mental health professional to sign off or to write a letter of support. Um, there sometimes is a weight requirement. So if an adolescent is significantly underweight because of their restrictive eating disorder um, or other reasons, they might not be prescribed. Um, but in terms of requirements for a mental health professional, 
writing a letter, it's really up to the discretion of the professional. Some people say they need to have identified as this new gender um, for six months, a year, two years, different organizations will say different things. I tend to believe my clients. Um, so if my clients, you know, identify as, or I shouldn't say identify as, if my clients are trans and they are ready to start puberty blockers, I tend to support it wholeheartedly, um, especially if it's been over, over eight months, I would say. So some work I did with Kai and his mom uh, are psychoeducation around puberty blockers. Mom was very much stressing over the misinformed belief that once Kai started to medically transition, none of this would be reversible if he changed his mind. And in reality, 98.4% of trans people experience no regret around medical, medically transitioning, but she was so focused on that 1.6% as we can imagine that a lot of parents would be. Um, but for those who do experience regret, most bodily changes are reversible with the right cocktail of hormones or medical interventions. For Kai, his restriction was coming from a place of wanting to deter puberty, particularly the growth of breasts and hips. So in addition to the recommended medical intervention of puberty blockers, we talked a lot about how else we express our gender outside of our body shape. And we landed on using a lot of um, drawing on himself. I imagine if he was over 18, it might be tattoos, but he was not over 18. Um, and utilizing professionally done piercings. He was very into self, so like at home piercings. I was not supporting that. Professionally done parent uh, consented piercings in order to better express his gender and sense of self. Of course, we also utilize DBT and particularly interpersonal effectiveness to work on his push-pull dynamics and self-advocacy skills. So how you can help. Uh, first, we wanna mirror the language that clients are using. If you're unsure what pronouns or words someone uses to explain their gender identity, just ask. Mirror language that you hear the clients use about their body. If they're using the word fat, to describe their body, whether or not it's accurate, use that descriptor back to them. If they're talking about dysphoria, about a part of the body that you might normally call breasts, but they're calling chest, use chest without question. And lastly, we wanna take the emotional labor off of the client to explain their experience to us. So if we have a question about terminology that they use or a concept that they brought up, take time on your off hours to Google and research. Um, how would someone find ED treatment that includes the gender exploration um, and trauma of growing up as a lesbian in the South? Um, how would you find that, that treatment that does include that? It's a lot of interviewing therapists and interviewing program centers. Um, so asking program centers, are you queer and trans affirming is usually the first thing I ask when I'm looking for um, other resources for clients. Are you queer and trans knowledgeable? Um, how do you best support your queer and trans clients? And then see how they answer and see how you feel about their answer. I also will give some resources um, at the end to, that might, that might be helpful. So we wanna ask about pronouns, birth, sex, and gender identity all separately. We wanna state that we are gender, queer, trans affirming without having the client having to ask. Um, so ideally, like this last question, ideally you'll be looking at therapist websites and they will already have their pronouns up or they will say, I am a queer and trans affirming clinician. Hopefully that will be there. I would encourage everyone to put that on their website if they feel that they have that, that skill set. And then we want to provide group settings in safe cohort environments specifically created for queer and trans folks in mind. So if you're working in a like a PHP program like we have or an IOP program, you want to include groups that are specifically focused on identity. Um, we have a question here from a provider, a dietitian. Um, she, this person had an FTM, he, him client would not gain weight um, didn't, because he didn't want to bring back his menstrual cycle. Mm. Um, so how would you navigate balancing that physical health while supporting the trans, you know, the FTM? Yeah. 
I would start by finding um, community for him. I will, like I said, in this, actually, Jill, could you just go to the next slide or some, whoever's doing the slides? Um, Sorry, I thought it was the next slide, it's not. So we have, yes, thank you. We have some resources here um, that I might suggest for this client. The Fed Up Collective is incredible. It stands for Fighting Eating Disorders in Underrepresented Populations. They have trans and non-binary support groups, um, as does the Eating Disorder Foundation for trans and non-binary folks going through recovery. So just creating a sense of community and finding that, oh, there are men who menstruate. There are non-binary folks who menstruate. I'm not the only one can be really helpful. Um, and also sometimes calling, calling body parts and calling body processes something different than what they were uh, originally taught as. So um, finding another word for menstruation or finding another word for getting your period um, can be helpful. All right, so we wanna follow uh, queer and trans legislation and amplify queer and trans voices in the media. A lot of the legislation that's going on right now is about keeping trans people out of collegiate sports and out of sports, uh, like publicly funded sports in general. There also was legislation recently being pushed forward in Texas to make uh, providing gender affirming medical care a felony um, and encouraging folks to turn in parents who were uh, seeking gender affirming care for their children. You wanna book bookmark resources that present um, news stories that are not just flashy news stories, not just trending events. Um, and then you wanna speak to referral networks about uh, finding credible education. I really want to encourage folks, if you are, um, uh, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. If you are looking for case consultation um, for a queer or trans client, I really, really encourage you to find a queer and trans provider and pay them for their time, pay them for their consultation, um, because cisgender heterosexual folks can be affirming and wonderful and all these things and also have blind spots around the experiences of queer and trans folks. So finding a queer trans provider to get that consultation from can be can be really helpful. And then checking the resources or contact us web pages of hotlines, um, internships, volunteer opportunities, etc. protecting your recovery. Um, so Fed Up Collective, I already mentioned, they used to be called TFED, which was uh, trans folks fighting eating disorders. Now they're called Fed Up. Um, they also run a dietitian match program. So it matches trans and intersex folks with low or no cost dietitians, eating disorder specific dietitians. Really, they do really incredible work. They also do trainings per, for providers as well as case consultations for providers looking for that. Um, some other ones that stick out are the Eating Disorder Foundation. They run free support groups for trans and non-binary folks, LGBTQ folks, but also folks like, um, they also have groups for, I think it's like women over 35 struggling with eating disorders. They have a women's group, um, really suggest checking them out. And then the last one that I will mention is the Trans Lifeline, which is uh, a suicide hotline staffed by and for trans folks, which is very, very cool. We have here a few Instagram accounts um, that might be helpful to follow. Project HEAL just launched a new clinical assessments program that provides clinical assessments uh, for free, which is incredible. So you'll get a diagnosis and maybe even a treatment recommendation or a level of care recommendation. Um, other ones are transequality.org, um, the QT BIPOC eating disorder support on Facebook, and I think Fed Up also has a Facebook support group. q and I'm open for it. Let's do it. All right, we got two questions so far. Mm -hmm. um, first one is, can you explain again the difference between saying someone identifies as or someone is? Yeah, yeah. so identifies as just puts a little bit of distance between the person and the identity. Um, so if I say someone identifies as a woman, it kind of implies that like they identify as a woman, but really I perceive them as a man or really they are a 
non-binary person or a man or whatever. So simply saying they are a woman or they are non-binary takes away the option to interpret it differently. And the next one is going to be a follow-up uh, for the, um, the, the, the boy who was trying not to get his menstrual cycle back. Um, mm -hmm. Would it be appropriate to refer him to a gynecologist and explore the idea of birth control to limit menstruation? I would say it really depends on the weight of the person, um, because if they are chronically underweight, um, if they are restricting and there's a question of, it, there could be a question of, are they not menstruating because of their weight or are they not menstruating because of birth control? That becomes really blurry. We want to know um, if someone is in a, we want menstruation to let us know that they're in a healthy body um, in terms of a healthy weight. But if they are consistently at a healthy weight, I would, I would consider using birth control as a way to stop menstruation. But again, as long as they've been at a stable weight for a significant amount of time, their dietitian is on board, the whole team is on board. Um, next one is just asking if we're sending out a handout with the resources. Do we have that to send out? We, we can, we can make it. Any other questions? Okay, so we do have some treatment programs available at Balance. We offer four different levels of care um, that fit into a comprehensive treatment program. Uh, we also do individualized treatment plans. We have our PHP program, which is our most intensive level of care, our IOP program. We have a daytime as well as a nighttime option for that, a Saturday program and groups and individual programs as well. Um, you are welcome to book a confidential discovery call with us. Um, it's a 20 minute call. You can ask about our programs, ask about what might be a good fit for you uh, and just get to know the staff at Balance a little bit better. Do we know when, oh wait, we have another question. Um, another provider. If I'm treating a trans woman, do I have to follow male guidelines for micronutrients? Hmm. That would be a question for a dietitian. I can definitely ask my team and get back to you if you want to send uh, your email to the host and panelists uh, chat. Thank you all for joining us today and stopping by. We're so honored that you guys chose to um, spend your time with us today. And we hope you enjoyed this webinar as much as we did. Um, like Beck was saying, if you guys would like to have an individualized conversation with us about any of the topics that we talked about today, about any of our resources or any of the uh, programs that we offer, please feel free to book a discovery call with us. I sent a link in the chat before, and there's also a few other links in there. One is to our webinars and other YouTube channel so that way you guys can look at the different topics that we've had in the past and in our upcoming ones and then also feel free to check out our other webinars coming up we also have a free support group that happens twice a month um, and we send emails about that out regularly thank you all so much for spending this time with me appreciate it thanks everyone we hope you have a good rest of your day